My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. My name is Jeffrey Ken, and welcome to another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. And I'm joined today by a friend of mine, David Shackleton, who works for a, a technology company. And uh, but I'll let uh, David uh, explain more about that in a moment. Uh, this podcast uh, is appearing as per usual on Wednesday, and will be available in the archives for the foreseeable future. Uh, David, welcome to Digital Oil and Gas. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me on. Now, tell me a little bit about um, about IDS, the company that you work for, a bit of its history and the role that you play there. So IDS was set up about 25 years ago when the still owner and director and CEO uh, created an app that would generate a daily drilling report for an oil and gas operator down in Australia. Um, it worked well. Uh, he installed it on a couple of floppy disks in their offices and uh, it was used successfully to produce PDF uh, daily drilling reports. That was in, um, in what part of Australia was that? It wasn't on the East Coast, was it? Yeah, it was in Adelaide. All right. So probably the yeah. client was uh, Santos and uh, who else is down there? Beach Energy is down there. So uh, it, it could well have been, yeah. Yeah. Coal seam gas plays or in the, um, uh, the, 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 the basins in the central or nor- northern, northeastern part of the state of uh, South Australia. Yeah, exactly. Um, they, they were a big operator, and he, he was working for them as a, a mudlogger geologist, and uh, they realized that he had some programming talent, so he sat down one weekend and uh, wrote the program out in Fortran. <laughs> well, that yeah. takes me back. I'm a COBOL yeah. programmer from way back, so uh, Fortran was the university language back in the 70s. Yeah, exactly. Well, it, it was when I was at university in the late 90s, too. So Right. Yeah. Now, you called it an app, but you did also say floppy disk, and those are two terms I've not heard expressed in the same sentence. Uh, so <laughs> was it, it sounds like it was more of a, a client's a, a, um, a, a desktop computer a standalone software product. Is that how it worked? Yeah, that would be it. Yeah, I I figure it would have been called a piece of software. Say software day, back yeah. in the days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, how did you come into this business, uh, David? I mean, your your background is in physics and stats and so forth. Um, so uh, d- drilling software, how, how did you get into that? Yeah, I, I was always interested in uh, mathematics at school and, and good at it because I did lots of it. Um, then uh, I kind of applied that or that was very useful for learning um, and understanding physics. Uh, so I got into physics. Um, I then taught uh, high school physics and math for 12 years, and I happened to be in Mexico where IDS needed an account manager uh, to help them with a a good uh, medium-sized client. They wanted someone who could understand the software and help uh, this company get the most out of the software and get good data into the system. And yeah, I just used my background in physics and statistics to learn the software um, and then kind of used my presentation skills from being a teacher and teaching skills uh, to help these guys get into the software and um, get good data in and uh, use the data to get good analytics out of it. Right. This is probably um, an important uh, point in all of this, which is the technology might might actually not be the hard part. Sometimes it's the teaching and learning and coaching and change management that is the, it is the hard part. Yeah, it certainly is. And um a big part of my master's degree was yeah, cultural understanding and uh, change management, um, as well as the kind of harder physics and software skills. So, right on. Yeah, it, it turned out to be a, a reasonable fit. Yeah. Well, let's let's get a little bit into the business problem that that uh, you know that that IDS initially was working to solve. And then we'll get into uh, some of the other broader uh, technologies that have been under development. But if you go back to to why. Uh, a daily drilling report was even of interest. We're, we're, tell, talk a little bit about what the problem is that, that the industry needs to, is trying to solve here. So my boss could probably go into more detail and more history, but <laughs> generally it's about communication and it's about management in the office, knowing what is going on in the field, uh, whether it's uh, levels of production, uh, how well a well is producing or 
how well a well is being drilled. Um, it's important that management in the office uh, has a clear picture of that. So the daily drilling report just just tells them that it's a, a simplified version of uh, what's happening at the rig and how well they're doing at the rig site in terms of drilling the well and completing it. And what what uh, I mean I'm, I'm imagining, but if you could elaborate, you know, what what are the sorts of things that a drilling report would want to even highlight? Like what 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 would head office be interested in? I presume progress per day would be one dimension. You know, get a forecast. Yeah, it's of how much progress time. per day. Yeah. ROP, rate of progress of uh, drilling the well, um, how many meters are they drilling per hour? Um, but probably before that, they're interested in any issues. So if a manager is look, overseeing you know, half a dozen wells, he'll be particularly interested in uh, a rig that's having downtime. Um, we, we have a client whose CEO wants to know that morning any rig that has had over six hours of downtime in the last 24 hours. So he gets an, he gets a special report uh, just on downtime. Um, sees and then sees that, that as a key indicator, I assume, of progress. Yeah. Yeah, or lack thereof. Um, he, and he'll want that. He'll want to know what that problem is and what's being done to rectify it. And uh, the um, uh, this would be for gas, for oil. Any, I assume, any kind of uh, uh, drilling site activity. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we we focus on basically everything up to the well producing. So from the rig move uh, to pre-spit activities, uh, to drilling completions, uh, and then workovers, interventions uh, as well. But uh, we, we don't specialize so much in um, production reporting. Yeah. Onshore, offshore, doesn't matter? Yeah, both. Yeah, both onshore and, and offshore. Um, and, and also oil and gas company operators and uh, drilling contractors too. Um, they both share very similar issues mm. uh, at this stage. Yeah. And what's the? I mean, aside from just having the data in the reports, so what? What? Why is this a hard problem to solve? Is it because the data points about current status are you know they're ga- are they gamed? Are they are they overly manual? It's just hard to collect. What, what's behind this? That's a good question. Um, I think on the one hand, it it, it it is a is a pretty straightforward task that we're trying to do. We're trying to communicate what's happening at the rig to management in the office. Um, it, it turns out there are a lot of data points. Um, we, we can, my boss commissioned a, a study into how many data points we're actually looking at, and he, he found um, about 10,000 different things that our clients are reporting on on any one day. Uh, for um, on so, it, off of any one drilling site? Not from one drilling site, just in total. In like total. The number of the number of different items of data that we collect or have collected over the years, it totals about 10,000. 10,000 so unique items it, per day. Hmm. It would be pretty difficult for someone to write a, a piece of software to capture that. Yeah. And uh, our software has certainly grown um, to be quite specific and um, quite complete, really, to be able to report on all these data points. And where does the data come from? Is it originating off of sensors that are rig mounted or is it coming out of ancillary systems or is it supplier data that you're you're catching for the report or is, is it all of the above? Yeah, all of the above. And traditionally, it's uh, it's been manual entry. Uh, over the last three or four years uh, with this downtime downturn, we've had time and our clients have had time to really look at uh, automating things. So we've gone from being almost fully manual uh, human entry just by typing into a keyboard uh, to now automating you know more than half of the daily drilling report and the the real key um, or real success that we've had over the last few years is automating the activities so taking the data directly from half a dozen or so on rig sensors downhole sensors um, running them through rig state detection and collapsing that data into a, a page or two of activities that uh, management have the time to go through and understand. So it sounds like it frees up significant amounts of what I would I would sense would be quite valuable engineering time from you know data data entry, data cleansing activities on a daily basis to uh, let them do what they'd rather do, which I think is run the rig and solve problems and so forth. So that's one uh, kind of leverage point. What other, what other benefits or leverage points uh, do your clients uh, really uh, zero in on as, as being of, of best value to them through all of this process? 
Yeah, it's certainly true. And um, we do see that as a pretty big waste of time. We, we see the clients uh, completing these reports and um, we see them spending between one and three hours on a daily report. And a, a lot of it is done from memory. Uh, some of it's done in the moment, but a lot of it, they're thinking back to, you know, when did we what start their activity? Yeah, what exactly. happened? Yeah. What time did that finish? Uh, it's very difficult to remember that. So by automating it, um, you get these times as accurate as you want, really, to within a second if, if you want that level of accuracy. Mm. And and that, that's the thing. Not only are we saving, you know, an hour or two of an engineer's time by collecting the sensor data and using it for the report, but also documents that are coming in from service provider, you know, the, the BHAs, the pipes, um, the mud details, the surveys, all this shouldn't be being retyped. Yeah. Uh, so we... we pull in um, Excel files, uh, PDF documents, we can now scan and pull straight into the daily reports and the analytics systems. Um, we're automating much of that process that traditionally is uh, just retyped. And are, they, are the fields, if people in the fields using phones, smart uh, devices, tablets these days to, to capture some of this data? They they certainly can do. Um, Whether they do is different, but you know they might have rules to cite which say no, no, no uh, electric devices at site. But you know, in practical terms, you you could. Yeah, we're certainly going towards that. Uh, we put our software, if you want to call it that, not mm. an app. Uh, we we put it online in two thousand and one, so we've been mm. web based since then. Um, we 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 used Flash, um, and then we saw the end of life coming for that. So we. Yep rewrote everything in HTML um, about three or four years ago. So, yeah, you can use that on your tablet and um, enter the data directly into a tablet for sure. Mm. And what, how does the industry react when you um, show them something like this? I mean, this saves this must save hours and hours of, of time for, for um, busy field professionals. I assume they would get quite, quite excited about something like this. Well, it's a lot of the time is uh, wasted in the office as well. Um, you know, sometimes these documents appear in the office and they're retyped by teams of people in the office. Um, we, I, I've uh, had meetings with operators and, yeah, they talk about teams of people putting this data into legacy reporting uh, services. Sort of a reformatting and make it make it pretty exercise, not necessarily adding much value, though, really. Not adding value at yeah. all. The, the document exists in PDF or Excel or on a piece of paper, and they're just putting that data, retyping it into a, a legacy reporting system yeah. to, to produce the daily reports. Yep. Um, so this would take time out of back office in addition to front office, and yep. the data is more accurate. Is there a compliance dimension to this? Are you find in some markets there's certain compliance um Reporting that that uh, it comes from field that 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 this could satisfy. We're, we're certainly wor working towards helping drilling contractors and operators to settle their contracts. You know how an operator will ask a drilling contractor to to drill, and um, yeah. the the fee structure is based on productive time and um, different states. And yeah. um, we're automating that to reduce discussion really yeah uh, well non-productive time is, yeah it's the non-productive time is the killer so it's a big focus on that what by it sounds like this data really removes a great deal of the argument and discussion about you know the, the underlying causes who's at fault um what what transpired and so forth yeah, yeah. so you've got summary documents you know graphically mm. displaying connection times and non-productive times and either the drilling contractor or the operator, depending who our client is, or, or if it's both, mm. they can sit down and show these charts to each other as evidence and have our software to drill into the data if there are any questions about the connection times or whatever. The, the raw data is also in the site, uh, so they can drill into it and, and just check anything, any detail. A, a, a drill? <laughs> What's that? It's a drilling into the data. So you're a, you're a, the the uh, the. It just made me laugh. The uh, the the pun, 
of drilling into the data for a drilling well, report. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah, that's what, that's what they do. But that's yeah, they, they can do. drill down and, and look at the raw data that yeah. was used to produce the charts. So. Yeah. They've got I, all the evidence they need. I, I know you're. I know you're uh, uh, working around the around the planet. Uh, do you find differences in, in, in between different markets, either you know, to the receptivity or the use of these sorts of reports, or certain behaviors from some markets that really should become standard across other markets? There's certainly more innovation in in some parts of the world, and and really, it's for me. It's uh, I don't want to be ageist, but the average age of the people that I've I've been dealing with over the past six years has gone from somewhere in the 60s, 60, you know, mid, early to mid 60s down to people in their 30s. Um, it's oh, young really? engineers, engineers in training that are texting me that I'm text messaging um, about the solutions and questions and they work in the evenings and, you know, these are hardworking guys, visionary. Um, they're willing to take risks uh, to do things differently do things better um so i find it's um age is the key and and outlook and openness to doing things different and better that's um, a, yeah that's rather amazing, than any actually. kind of geographic differences yeah well there's been a, a huge outflow of, of uh, senior uh, expertise uh from the industry since 2014 through the through the downturn i think many many organizations i spoke to recognized because they had gone through a similar wave 2008 2009 where um, much of the uh, senior talent packaged out and and uh, left uh, when the when the upswing came, uh, companies bereft of of that exact uh, that leadership and supervisory know how. So in 2014, 2015, yeah. the, the the general view I had, uh, had come across was to uh, retain more of that senior capability and on, because the down, the upswing should have should have arrived um, but then over over the last couple of years the particularly in Canada the the cutbacks have been so extreme that even that supervisory level is now gone which would lead you to find yourself interacting with quite junior individuals now yeah and the the, the more junior staff are realizing look you know I can't just go down the corridor and ask um Joe, who's in his late fifties and sixties, um, <laughs> Joe's not there. He's, he's, he's not there. He's gone. So <laughs> they're, they're having to do all they can to make these operations better. Uh, yeah. So they're, re they're really stepping up to to get better solutions. Yeah. And are there some aside from the 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 this um, adoption curve, which I think you're you're hinting at is. Uh, slanted in favor of a, a more a younger uh, workforce that doesn't have access to the senior expertise and therefore seeking you know more tools to assist them with the job. Um, are there uh, are there uh, differences in um, in how drilling say takes place in in some markets over over others that that also drives a either a difference in a, a attitude towards these technologies or is it is it just limited to you know the the uh, how how close the users are to um to digital tools as a as a, a way of life yeah i i don't really notice um the difference really i think mm. in, in in developing countries uh, that i've worked in i i see some companies are very willing to do things better, um, do things differently, bring in technology. Mm. Um, and the same with very developed countries um, like the US, they're under a lot of pressure to to improve um, in just the same way. So I don't really see any economic differences. Um, well, I, I do see economic differences, but I don't see differences in willingness to do things differently yeah, um, take up, yeah. because a country's rich or poor or more developed or less developed. That's so not really just, a driver, yeah. It's just I mean, about the attitude of the company and the yeah, people working for it. Yeah, year, many years ago I worked in China. What we what I found at the time was that Ch the Chinese companies were very, very interested, very interested in leapfrogging um, and, and getting ahead of the, uh, uh, the uh, market rather than simply taking current state. They were quite happy to move very quickly beyond... Um, that if, if this if this sort of behavior or, or or pace of change is evident in some markets over others, it's it's another reason why I think uh, domestic companies of in any any economy do need to uh, step up their game uh, because of yeah. the, you know that potential. Yeah, they're probably hungrier for doing things better, so I think they're so. willing to take bigger risks and do things more differently, I guess, than 
very established uh, companies that have been doing pretty well for the last couple of decades. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now, aside from uh, drilling, um, re- uh, daily drilling reports, what else are you, do you, um, you know, other other technology solutions that you're currently working with or you'd like to highlight? Anything else come to mind? Well, to be honest, uh, this is where we're getting a lot of interest, um, automating the reporting, automating analytics and, you know, studying performance of drilling rigs. That's the main area of interest at the moment, to be honest. Um, we, we stepped into the engineering world and construction world where we saw very similar issues. Yeah. Uh, so we've, we've adapted our solutions for, for the engineering and construction world too. Mm. Uh, we've stepped into production. Um, but no, to be honest, the, the main focus is on um, – this on, kind on of niche drilling areas, area of yeah. drilling, yeah, drilling yeah. operations. Yeah. Do you see other other potential areas where there is, um, you know, either either cost or productivity opportunities that that have yet to be tapped? Well, we're we're working with industry and um, bodies that are trying to standardize uh, the way data is moved around between companies. Mm. Um, organizations like Energistics with their WitsML. Um, protocol for moving operational drilling data around. Um, we, we very much support that because it just helps move the data around from service companies to operators and to drilling contractors. They all share um, this data. So if they have a, 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 a like a, a unique protocol for sharing that data, uh, we can all kind of speak the same language and it just streamlines everything. Yeah, that is certainly a big prize. You know, from a from a, from a certain standpoint, though, if you're a, a technology company, not, uh, not, not, not necessarily software, but say service, um, it's actually economically within your best interests to create your own walled garden because it creates a kind of customer lock-in effect. So, so once, once they're on your platform, they can't leave and... If you make it difficult for the data to leave, then it it, it kind of traps the customer, if you like. And so, um, it, it it takes a very long time to unglue that. But other other industries have figured out that this more open and transparent ways of exchanging data is much more valuable. The automotive industry is a good example of that, where the you know there's different different um, practices in the industry to allow all cars to go to all gas stations, for instance. You could you'd easily imagine a world where the, the engineers for various vehicles decided that, no, 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 the fuel tank, can't, we're, we're going to make our fuel tank slightly different and therefore you can't use uh, this the supplier of fuel. Um, that kind of lock-in yeah, has been historically part and parcel of how you make money in oil and gas. So it, it sounds like it's starting to become unlocked, which is a big, it's a big move. I, I think it is. Um, I think... Uh, and it, that kind of leads to the next uh, point is uh, mm. is collaboration. Um, there has to be an effort to collaborate to get these standards together, uh, use these standards. Um, it's down to operators and drilling contractors too to to ask or tell their service providers to give them the data in a certain format. Um, but you know we're not waiting for that. We're getting the data in in whatever format it is, whether it's WitsML or uh, PDF or Word documents, uh, Excel documents, emails. Um, we're, we're not waiting for this standardization, to yeah. be honest. But uh, yeah. we are certainly supporting it and you know, working. For example, we just did some work with the International Association of Drilling Contractors. They have a, a daily drilling report, the Tower Sheet, and uh, we work to, to standardize their electronic version for that report. Um, yeah, so illustration. Yeah, it just underscores that even even the world of you know a, a lack of data standards and multiple ways to move data around are falling to the the onslaught of you know, digital innovations, which would do things like read a PDF and pick out the right data and automation tools that can move data between spreadsheet and system and back again in the flash of an eye, and it makes a huge uh, big big productivity savings uh, lur- lurking in all of that. That's very true. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so just uh, I'm sure through years of experience in all of this, you must have taken away a handful of, you know, what I'd call critical lessons. You know, what any any that come to mind? Um, well, the, the first thing I noticed uh, when I started looking at the data that IDS has been collecting in their databases for years and years is uh, data quality. Um, that's where it starts. Um, once you've 
once you've realized where the gaps are or where you want to improve yeah. and what data you need to collect, uh, make sure that data is accurate and stored logically, neatly in one single source, a database, um, <laughs> not Excel, uh, or any other spreadsheet where you save just multiple versions, versions of it. Versions of it, yeah, version controls problem. Um, needs yeah. to be in a database where, yeah, you can see the history of where that data has come from, how it was changed, who changed it, um, and yeah. so on. It needs to be in a database uh, that's connected to a, an analytics tool. Um, a lot of the legacy reporting systems don't have their own an analytics tool. So you, you, some companies are desperate to get their data out of these legacy reporting systems to try and get them in um, Spotfire or Power BI to try and analyze the data. And uh, that, that's pretty tricky. Yeah. Um, yeah, still a big open area, though. I mean, considering the, the, the amounts of data that oil and gas is, has collected and stored over the years. Um, but it's interesting that you highlight quality is one of the key uh, key issues. Uh, um, uh, getting quality uh, correct. That's every. I think that's everything from simple things like uh, you know if a field is supposed to be text, it is text, and if it's supposed to be capitalized, it is capitalized. And, and if, it, if um, an abbreviation is is used, it's used absolutely consistently throughout. And all that's that. It sounds so mundane and, and routine, but in fact, that is the one of the problems of you know what we call crappy data quality. It's just this thorough inconsistencies in the data make it almost almost unusable. Yeah, we we've come across lots of examples. Um when we were putting data together uh, to compare different companies' data, um, just country names, we, we found about 20 different versions of the countries that make up the UK, for example. Um, <laughs> well, that, that's Scotland. probably, a, that's going to be good with Brexit coming, actually. <laughs> well, that might complicate things further. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but just just employing drop-down menus for, you know, what's the name of this country? It's the UK. There it is. Click, click yeah. on the UK. Uh, then that avoids you using England or Scotland or Britain or Great Britain. You, you know, GBR, you've got one yeah. choice. On on, it's yeah. GBR. Yep. Uh, you just got one choice, United Kingdom or UK. Choose that. Same with um, activity codes. We found 20 different codes for stuck pipe um, throughout our databases. Mm. Um, so we standardized that. There's now a drop down list and you just select the code associated with stuck pipe. Yeah. But there's two 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 elements to all of that. Of course, one is the data is correct. In other words, if it's if it if its country code is meant to be UK, it is UK. Um, and then the metadata is correct, which is you know the 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 apps the the value of the term, if you like, and the field is consistent across all of these databases. And this is this whole world of data science and data thinking that that uh, needs to be brought to bear uh, as a, a kind of a core discipline um, in a digital world. And um, so it's 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 still fascinating to keep coming across this as a, a critical problem area for the you know to overcome in order for these tools to really deliver the value promise that they offer. Yeah, and, and it's pretty rare to have to reinvent these standards. Um, mm. This work we did with yeah the country, IADC, country that, code that, yeah that was rare to actually have the opportunity to develop a new standard. Yeah, um, and once that's used, it can be used by all their members on. A thousand those thousand drilling rigs right it's, yeah. it's done it's a standard but you know there are standard lists for country codes yep for sure true. And, yep. Um, activity codes less so but um you know if, if within one company um with you know 30 40 clients they're all using the same codes it's um it's much much more efficient yeah yeah very or true. Even, even just within one company they're using just one code uh, rather than a description mm. that's a big start in, in uh, of your the organizations that are are um, you know taking full advantage of your your um, you know, drilling um, report and drilling area, what you know what is it that you are uh, seeing as uh, the the kind of behaviors that m make them successful? Do they does it start with investing time and energy and getting the data right? Is that is that one of the keys? It definitely is. It definitely starts there. Um, it starts with getting the data right, and then you quickly find they get to some quite sophisticated questions and studies. Um, like one client the other day is like time of day connections. Why are connections so long at this time of day? 
in fact, I'm not sure if they are, but I've, I've noticed a couple of times, a couple of rigs, that the connections are really long at this time of day and night. Mm -hmm. So we're like, okay, we'll put a, a scatter plot together of connection times, plot them all on a 24-hour horizontal axis there, and uh, and look for patterns. Let's see where the connections are taking a long time. Yeah, and, um, shift change. So once you've yeah. got the fundamentals right of um, getting good data in, you get this wealth of these high-level questions um, from the drilling managers, so, you know, questions that they've had in the back of their minds for, for years probably. Mm -hmm. um, they're now able to get to the data and have the power to, to you know, get hard evidence um, and then do something about the problem, showing the charts um, clearly. Yeah. That's yeah, fascinating. This is a uh, is a straightforward a function as as knowing what's going on in the drill site. Uh, David is uh, continues to be a, a challenging area. Um, any closing thoughts before we uh, before we wrap up uh, this episode? Uh, I can't think of anything to be honest. Well, how no. do people how do people reach you? Are they follow you on LinkedIn somewhere? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, David Shackleton. Um, and uh, yeah, you can check out our, our website, um, idsdatanet.com. Dot com, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Can't okay, see the latest. Uh, thank you very much, David. And uh, thank you, listeners who tuned in for today's episode of uh, Digital Oil and Gas. We'll return in a week's time. If you like this episode, uh, by all means, uh, uh, tell your friends and uh, leave us a review because that helps other, people's, uh, other people find the podcast. Uh, David, once again, thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.